employer who's been recommended to judgeship in 2017. A dozen other people who have been recommended judgeships get their judgeship, but Saurabh Kirpal is not made a judge of the Delhi High Court, and the government of India is sitting on your judgeship. Five years later, let's get this clear. Is it because you openly declared your sexuality, that you were gay, that you genuinely believe that is the reason why the government of India has held up your judgeship, that the government of India cannot accept a gay judge? Well, I don't think there's any other way of seeing it, Rajdeep. The fact of the matter is, as you said, there are 12 recommendations. 11 are appointed. I am not. Now, I'm either rather very special, which uh, other than my parents, no one else really believes. So what is the reason, right? And when you scratch the surface and you start examining the alleged reasons that have been given, uh, they're so specious that you think that the real reason is my sexuality. There is absolutely no other possible reason that can come to my mind. Secondly, I also have from some informed sources within the collegium that that is, in fact, the reason, right? So there's no point uh, just guessing. This is stuff that I have heard. So, I mean, have you, have you made any effort or a, an attempt to find out why? I mean, surely your curiosity must have asked you. Others are being made judges. I am not, even though the collegium has recommended my name. You're today telling me you've heard from sources. Are you in a position to actually be able to be told at any stage that this is the reason why we've held up your judgeship? Look, I really believe that a person who is a candidate to be a judge must have no interaction with the executive, right? This is not something I'm dying to do because uh, of personal ambition. To be a judge is a very grave, important thing which requires independence from its very inception, right? So if I start interacting with the executive today to find out why is it that they're not making me a judge, if I have that curiosity about myself, I'd be starting off my judicial career, if any, on a very, very weak footing. So no, I have not asked anybody. And of course, the collegium system is so opaque and the way the government works is so opaque, no one has approached me either. I'll come to the opacity of the collegium system in a moment, but I want to press you just one last time. This is a country where Article 370, uh, Section 377 has been decriminalized. So homosexuality is no longer a crime. Homosexuality is no longer held in any other sphere of life, hopefully, against an individual. But it appears that the government of India believes that having a gay judge in some way would compromise the system. I mean, make sense of that for, for us, for the audience. Look, I think you expect too much of the powers that be and even our country when you said that Section 377 has been decriminalized and therefore all is well. No, it isn't. All Section 377 did was to make sure that a person who has consensual private sex does not go to jail, right? The entire gamut of disabilities, prejudices, they subsist. They've not disappeared with the passing of one verdict or one judgment. They will also not disappear. So for every young person today who thinks that the 377 judgment was about equality and about freedom and it liberated everybody, uh, that's simply not true. The, I think the vast majority of the country carries on today thinking the way they did earlier. And certainly, I would say, the government also, which at the end of the day was not rejoicing and embracing the reading down of Section 377. They did not file an affidavit saying decriminalize. They said, you do what you want to do. So it was a reticence that they showed even at that stage of the hearing. And that reticence is now to a much greater extent. For instance, the same-sex marriage petitions. They are uh, filing affidavits which say that marriage can only be between a biological man and a biological woman. So the powers that be, I don't know whether the politicians or the bureaucrats or who it is, but all of them, I think, have a certain mindset or a worldview which is some 20 years behind the rest of the world and certainly 20 years behind the youth of this country as well. 
you know, uh, Mr. Rodgi, you perhaps have greater access to the executive since you were Attorney General. You tell us, is the government of India so conservative today that they seem to be repelled by the very idea that India would have a gay judge or someone who's openly uh, saying that, uh, you know, he or she, uh, he is a gay judge. Are you telling me that there are people in this government who cannot accept that very prospect? Uh, Rajdi, before I answer your question, the first thing is that neither the collegium nor the executive government is in the habit of writing back or responding. So there is no way that Saurabh can write a letter and expect a reply. It's completely out of sync as far as our judicial or executive uh, system is set up. Secondly, I also agree with Saurabh that a judgment may have come, but it's not as if that vast majority here is actually jumping with joy. Yes, it affects those who are affected by it, but a lot of people are indifferent to it, a lot of people don't care. So it's not such a big thing for India and its people. And as he said, you know, you may have a judgment, but mindsets don't change by judgments only. Look at, look at untouchability, look at the ugly side of casteism. It was supposed to have been long gone, but you read about it every day in the papers, ugly incidents, people being uh, you know, tortured or killed between the lower caste, higher caste and all that. And uh, as far as the reason is concerned, it is, I have no doubt in my mind that the only reason is sort of sexuality. I will tell you from, from another angle. The law is that once the collegium recommends, the government has the right to consider and maybe send back the recommendation with certain queries. That was done. But once the queries are answered by the collegium, and in their own words, quote unquote, the request is reiterated, then post the reiteration, there is no escape from the fact that the person has to be appointed. That is a verdict which cannot be disobeyed. That is what the law is. Reiteration in this case has happened four years or three years ago. After that, there is no reason why the verdict of the collegium should not have been followed. Now, here lies the weakness of our system. Once that is the law, that is the verdict of the highest court, it has to be followed. And it is jolly well dependent on, on the court to ensure that its verdict is followed. I mean, if you're going to have a court which gives a verdict which is not followed, then the entire system of judiciary and the rule of law will break down. I mean, a verdict will be followed to the T, to the end, if it's a dispute, say, between me and you. But it will not be followed if it is in a situation like this. This is actually a case of breakdown of the rule of law, rule of orderliness in society and civilization. And if the Supreme Court does not wake up and do its job, it will mean that the verdicts will no longer be invariably followed. That is the sad part of this larger picture. See, to Saurabh, it doesn't matter beyond a point because he's a good, hardworking, bright, and a successful lawyer. So it's not as if that he's hankering for the post. There are many who hanker for the post because they, not much is going for them. It doesn't really matter in his case because he's, he's a very busy counsel. But the larger and the sad part of the picture is that a unanimous verdict of the court is being disobeyed randomly. You know, but that precisely is bringing me, uh, Mr. Rodgi, to what is the big concern at the moment. We've got now the judiciary and the executive over several judicial appointments, finding themselves in a tug of war, and the government of the day just sits for months, in his case for years, on appointments at a time when la a number of courts are short of judges and no reasons are attributed. 
Instead, the law minister of the country is today saying, get rid of this collegium system. Let's have a new system where the executive also has a role in deciding judges. See, uh, Raidi, I firmly believe that the collegium system is out of sync. Is out of sync? Yes. Firstly, it is not provided by law. It's not a creature of the law or the constitution. It was never meant to be there. It's a power which has been arrogated by the Supreme Court to itself in what is called the second judge's case in the year 1993. It should never have been there. Once you arrogate power to yourself, nobody practically wants to give up that power. And that is why they have hung on to this power. Now, having hung on to this power, they should at least till the time this judgment is not overturned, or the NJAC judgment is not overturned, till that time, even if the system is opaque, even if it is imperfect, whatever decisions it takes must be followed. Ultimately, that is the bottom line. And now, I mean, the law minister is going on saying it's not okay, it's not okay. But till the time you find an alternative solution, you must follow this system. It is not open to any government or any body or any authority under our constitution to say that we are not going to follow it. I mean, you say that the government is sitting over the recommendations yes. four years ago. I don't think it's a case of sitting over. I, I think it's a case of cocking a snook. Yes. I'm not going to do it. I mean, four years, you can't be sitting over four years. So, sitting over can mean one month, two months, three months, six months. It can't mean four years. And therefore, the court must act. No, why, I mean, that's what I wanted to know in conclusion on this subject. What should the court do? Should they write as you said, the, the government may not write back. They may just keep silent. Uh, what should the judges do when a judge is being denied his judgeship prima facie on what seems extremely subjective considerations that because of a judge's sexuality or, or an individual's sexuality, he will not be made a judge? Yeah. You're not lo looking at his, uh, his quality of his law or the quality of his work. You're looking at something which is completely extraneous. See, Raidiv, it's very simple. If a court delivers judgment, in our system, it is the job of the court to ensure that the judgment is followed. Whether it's a private property case, whether it's a case dealing with shares of a company, whether it deals with the service jurisprudence about promotion, about appointment, it is the job of the court to ensure that the judgment is followed. Now, obviously, once the highest court in the land has taken a view in a particular matter or a judgment or a decision. It is the job of that court to ensure that it must be followed. And there are systems and procedures for making a party follow a judgment. It's not something novel. You can always take up those, those uh, practices and rules and enforce it. So you're calling on the Supreme Court in a way of taking up uh, yes. uh, uh, Saurabh Kipal's case yes. aggressively with the government of the day, See, saying simply follow yes. what lies in the law of the land. And the court has powers to force you to follow. Otherwise, the court and the system will be a system uh, subject to ridicule. I mean, I will tomorrow go and tell the Supreme Court, you may pass a judgment against me, but I'm not going to follow it. Let's see what you can do. The moment that happens, the entire system of rule of law will, will, will completely uh, crumble. And you will have a law of the jungle then. Ironically, you're saying this while also saying that the collegium system needs to change. True, but till it changes, right. follow it up. Okay, you know, just, 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 yes, go just ahead. one more point. The Supreme Court is not in the habit of giving advice. It gives judgments which are meant to be followed. It's not just saying things, okay, this sound, I think this should be the case, but you choose whether to do it or not, right? Individual citizens are expected to follow the law of the land. Individual citizens are expected to obey judgments of the court. In a court, when we see blind lady justice with her scales in her hand, an individual is the same as a government. It cannot be that the law binds an individual. They are forced to follow it. But when it comes to the government, they get a free pass. Right? That's important. I, I want to do understand, uh, uh, Saurabh, as an individual, therefore, do you feel less than equal? You know, the constitution of the country guarantees equality. Do you feel less than equal today when simply because you've been open, candid, and honest about your sexuality, the institution which you're part of seems to almost reject you or the government of India. Why blame the institution? The government of India, which is there to uphold the constitution of the land, is rejecting you. 
Well, of course, I feel less than equal. There's no question about that. You feel that. less than equal. Of course, it is quite uh, quite evidently the case that it is less than equal, and I'm not going to give the collegium a free pass either here, right? It's well and good to say that the government is sitting on a file. Yes, they are, but what exactly is the collegium doing about that either? So they too are sitting on it, right? It takes two to tango, so it's very uh, easy to blame the government, and yes, one can blame the government, but it's not as though the collegium has covered itself with glory either. Do you think civil society though should stand up in a way, uh, the same civil society that stood up in a way to ensure the decriminalisation of Section 377? Do you believe that's possible at all when you are faced with the might of the Indian state on the other side? Well, I think I believe in the power of civil society is far more than the might of the Indian state. Right? If you have true protest, if you have a true revolution, one revolution happens every five years in the ballot box. But there can be a daily revolution that happens in the simple act of resistance by the individual concerned. So I think yes, it can happen. You know, the, it's a good point on which to turn to the book because a lot of the judgments that you or the cases that you've tracked simply show actually that our judiciary at times can reflect the mood of the country uh, and and in a way also be a step ahead uh, at times of civil society. Let's start, for example, with the Vishaka judgment. The, the judgment that in a way ensured that sexual harassment at the workplace was unacceptable. I found it interesting that in a book that says cases that shaped India's financial landscape, financial landscape, you chose the Vishaka judgment as one of the judgments to highlight. Now, many would say here was an example of the courts being ahead of the times, ensuring that companies, corporates kept procedures in place to protect women at the workplace. Why did you choose this in a book that in many of the other cases reflects hard financial, economic, business judgments? Well, very simply, when we talk of India's financial landscape, what is India if not its people, right? And are 50% of India's people not women? So when we talk of the financial landscape and we exclude the discussion about 50% of its population, then I don't think we're doing justice to the true conception of the financial landscape. So that is one aspect of what I meant by India's financial landscape, just the women of India, how it impacted. But also, and the research in the book that I've done shows this, is that a company which has a toxic culture of sexual harassment typically underperforms other companies. There's a massive economic cost accompanying workplace harassment. And therefore, it is incumbent on companies to take themselves and ask themselves, what systems do we have in place that we won't have sexual harassment? And yet companies didn't do that, right? That shows that companies don't always work on the basis of what is economically sensible for them. Uh, there are other things at, at play. You know, the, the reason I ask you this is because Interestingly, a few years ago, when the Me Too movement really took off, many companies, rather than sort of stand up and defend the rights of women, were often accused of finding ways to protect their male employees. Even though the Vishaka judgment actually gave enough powers to companies and women indeed to enforce their rights. Some did, but some did not. Are we coming again to the issue raised that while we have often progressive judgments, Society doesn't embrace the progressiveness that even courts may try to put, put forward. Whether it's then decriminalizing uh, 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 homosexuality through Section 377 or the Vishaka judgment that virtually empowers companies and women to act against those responsible for sexual harassment. See, the Vishaka judgment empowers women and mandates companies. Right. Companies don't, don't have an option but to follow the law. Right? There's the Vishaka judgment and now you have the Posh Act. But you're right, Rajdeep. Uh, the problem is that the top structures of power in a company are the very same people who are going to be indulging in incidents of sexual harassment. Or even if they're not the actual person who's doing it, they are people of very senior management. And it is felt sometimes, and I think wrongly, by the top management that we need this particular person. There is also a perception in uh, top management in India is that women have a habit of just lying and making stories up. Uh, a woman's voice is more readily disbelieved than it should be. 
So these are the twin factors, I think, which lead uh, companies not to obey the law and not to take harassment seriously, which is, makes no economic sense. You know, because we are coming, uh, Mr. Rodgi, to the issue of individual rights. You know, as a post, you know, Saurabh's book, in a way, looks at a post-1991 India. An India which, because of economic liberalization, has moved in all kinds of directions. Uh, you know, the opening up of the airwaves, the hero uh, uh, judgment, which effectively allowed us to uplink. Uh, you know, even television channels in the early 90s were not even allowed basic right of uplinking live programming. Given the fact that there is such an emphasis on individual rights, and courts are emphasizing that time and again, do you believe it's important for governments also now to recognize individual rights? When, for example, a Disha Ravi, the environmental young environmental activist last year, was arrested under sedition, for allegedly being part of some global conspiracy against the government of India. Is the government behind society? Society is well ahead of government when it comes to protecting, preserving individual rights. I would like to take the question. Yeah. I would like to uh, split government into its various spheres. One is the politicians. One are the bureaucrats, the third is the police. So if you have these three spheres, in matters of sedition which you are talking about, I have seen in the last five years, a lot of cases of sedition, which are palpably false, are being foisted on, on people who are raising their voices, like the example you gave or many other examples. I find that in several cases, it's the police which is trigger happy because they think that they can please their political bosses by adding serious and serious offenses, thinking in their minds that the government is against, government means the political leadership is against these individuals. So you slap such uh, serious offenses, like using a hammer to kill a fly. And this may or may not be, uh, you know, prompted by the political leadership. I have seen those cases also. But yes, there is no doubt that uh, uh, individual rights are taking a beating. And uh, Several harsh measures, including loss of liberty or curtailing of liberty, may be happening, despite the fact that the law upholds individual rights and abhors these kind of uh, situations. You take this Navlakha's case, for example. The Supreme Court said one week ago that he should go to house arrest. But for the last one week, matter has been dithering here and there. That shows that the judgment of the court is not being followed very promptly till the Supreme Court came down heavily yesterday and said that you implement the judgment. These are instances to show that not only uh, are these authorities exceeding their briefs, but they also sometimes feel that they should be more loyal than the king. That you know, you're, you're, you're mentioning this because uh, you were also the lawyer, I think around this time last year in the Aryan Khan case, and uh, there, there was again, you know, apparently as it increasingly is evident, uh, overreach by the Narcotics Control Bureau. And uh, Aryan Khan, son of uh, Shah Rukh Khan, spent three weeks in jail. So, I mean, we, are, we seem to be reaching a point where the police and the law enforcement agencies, and you mentioned Gautam Navlakha's case very importantly as well, where the police was not willing to, uh, or the NIA, was not willing to put him even under house arrest despite a Supreme Court order. Where is the problem? Is it that these agencies believe that they are above the law? Do they believe that they will get political protection if they follow a particular political agenda? What really? You are not the Attorney General anymore, so you can speak very freely. Yeah, as, I said, as I said, sometimes uh, they are more loyal than the King. So if you do something... NIA is also police. If you do something, maybe excessive, 
but they feel that it will please the political bosses, so they will do it. Secondly, there's also a general feeling that if it's a government authority, a bureaucrat, or, or the police or whatever, they might willy, Sorry, they might willy-nilly, uh, you know, get their way, and the courts will not take it very uh, seriously or harshly if their actions are somewhat, you know, their aberrations, as opposed to an individual's aberrations. So that's the general feeling that we will get away with something or the other. The court will. We will take it lightly. It might please the bosses. So how, how do you stop it, uh, Mr. Rodhgi? Do you think that there should be some, you know, some kind of penal measures against those see, who do not follow court orders? Obviously, see, the law is very clear that everybody has to follow the court's order, whether it's an individual, it's a private organization, it's a bureaucrat, it's a police or X or Y. Everybody has to follow the court order. And it is for the court to uphold its esteem by ensuring that there should not be a feeling that if a private person disobeys the law, he might be hauled up uh, and he may go to jail. But if a government authority uh, doesn't follow the law, uh, it'll be uh, treated lightly. So people are entitled to know that everybody should be treated equal. The scales of justice are equal, whoever is on whichever side. So it's actually for the court and the system of the judiciary from top to bottom to, to ensure and uphold its esteem in the eyes of the public. Again, we go back to rule of law. If the general feeling goes around that you may do uh, something or the other uh, and uh, one side will get away lightly, it's going to you know, uh, uh, lead to a complete breakdown of the law. The system of, the ju system of justice must be dispensed with, with an equal hand, with an, with an equal uh, thing. If it is harsh, it has to be harsh on both. If it is light, it has to be light on both. So that, that is what uh, should be done, and it is for the Supreme Court to set the tone. So in that sense, just on the, on the Aryan Khan case, since it made so many headlines, would you really like to see either the court or uh, some authority that has the powers to act against those NCB officials who are now accused, in a way, of overreach? See, the court should have acted even in the Aryan Khan case. Should have acted. Should have acted. Uh, apart from releasing him, should have acted by saying if there is n nothing in that case, there is no evidence. You put a young boy in jail for three weeks because there was a lot of uh, hoo-ha about this case. Everybody was watching. I mean, he was out in three weeks. Could have taken three months. Mm -hmm. I told them that you are lucky that three weeks, to you it seems a lot, but when I do cases in the Supreme Court, Three weeks, three months, four months, six months, one year is a normal period for an under trial to get bail if he can go from court to court. Therefore, the court could have acted and said, now let us see which are the officers who directed arrest instead of just, uh, you know, letting things go. Could have acted and said, apart from anything else, it could have told NCB, as I said uh, in that occasion, if you made a mistake, if the mistake was genuine, why didn't you apologize to the person whom you arrested wrongly? Why didn't you apologize in the court? And if you, if you think you can get away with any arrest and only think that bail can be granted, the court could have jolly well imposed costs, imposed some penal punishment, monetary punishment for uh, you know, curtailing somebody's liberty. It has happened I mean, uh, abroad. It happens routinely for wrong arrests. If you put in a person for a month or two or three, you can get millions of dollars from the state. Here it can't be millions, but at least there'd be a token. It could have been a fine of 10,000 rupees on the officer who directed the arrest. As simple as that. You know, Saurabh, I'm presuming you wrote this book before the court judgment came in the money laundering case, in the PMLA case, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Because when I read that judgment, as a student of law, it seems to have completely overturned the very basis of our jurisprudence. You are now told that even first the enforcement director officers have such uh, have powers equivalent to that of the police and they can come to your house and you are presumed to be guilty if you are raided and you have to prove your innocence. So the PMLA judgment has effectively reversed the basic principle of rule of law, innocent till proven guilty. And it is leading to the enforcement directorate in particular getting 
over overarching powers and people being kept in jail for months on end now given the fact that your book looks at cases that shaped india's financial landscape are you worried that the courts also need to recognize that when you pass such orders a number of business persons will say we will do business anywhere else but in india you're absolutely right had that judgment come in advance i would have definitely covered it it would have been your chapter 16 it would probably have been chapter 0 actually because today there is a problem of massive unemployment in our country we talk about how the youth of today don't have sufficient jobs and the way to ensure that does not happen is by creating further jobs right and to create a job it's not going to be a magic wand that's going to come and not everyone can get government employment you need to have foster business and a good business environment now you cannot possibly have a good business environment when every business person thinks that if i even do business as per the t there is some over zealous officer who has been armed by the legislature through draconian legislations like the pmla who will put me in jail there are so many indian businessmen that i know i know uh, mr rodgi will also know who are leaving this country in droves setting up shop outside india taking jobs that really belong within our country for our people and taking them outside there's an export of kind of a of 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 the kind of a brain drain which has begun again uh, so i think the way these authorities behave is not only because they themselves believe they will get away with it they have been empowered unfortunately by legislation right the pmla and the nia are of course also we must remember these are acts passed by the upa government right so in this all politicians are the same so i think i'll keep it away from party political having said that they have been further draconian amendments in the recent past there is there is no getting away from that either so it's uh, i you can't be too cute about it the fact is that there is a greater oppression in the more recent past of business persons than there was 10 years ago uh, so and it was responsibility of the courts to come to the aid of the citizen and uphold the constitution that is their job right their job is not to give speeches or sessions and seminars but to strike down legislation which is patently discriminatory i would like to yes. add i was one of the lawyers along with kapil sibal and some others who argued this case i mean i am very sad at the result this is certainly a shot in the arm for these enforcement agencies it has given them much more actually than what the law gave i was the counsel with saurabh when one provision of this act was struck down by the supreme court that provision was that no bail can be granted unless the judge gives a certificate at that stage without a trial that the person is innocent <laughs> so i had argued that how can you have a law like this that a judge after one month grants bail without uh, you know a full trial and how can a judge give a certificate like this is absolutely arbitrary it was struck down by a bench of the supreme court headed by justice nariman uh, a strong uh, force on the uh, if i may say so uh, on the side of liberty but uh, this judgment kind of now overturns that verdict i am only glad that a review petition against the judgment has been entertained and we hope uh, for for the cause of liberty and citizens that this matter is heard at the earliest and maybe the judgment is reversed if not in full measure at least in some measure that's one let me give you another example gst has been a boon for the government while ironing out different state laws relating to taxes entry tax sales tax vat etc it's a great law it was brought in by mr jetley but it also has some penal provisions now in this case it's only the authorities under the gst act who are abusing the system the law never uh, intended it to be abused in this form and this the example is this gst act says that if the tax which has been evaded is more than 5 crores in volume in value 
only then will you arrest a person and it will be a non-cognizable offense which means you will go to jail and he will get bail after some months. If the offense is less than 5 crores, you may be arrested but you will easily get bail because it is bailable. The officer himself will release you in bail. I told the Supreme Court in one case the other day that I must have done three, four hundred cases of bail in the GST law in the last, what, three, four years. I have not seen a single case where the allegation is lo lower than five thousand, five crores. How is it possible that in every case, from the smallest to the biggest, the allegation is always over five, five crores, so that you have the power of arrest, bail will not be granted, it will take months, years, weeks, so we seem, we seem to have reversed the very premise that we the Supreme Court been. spoke about, about bail, not jail. Exactly. We increasingly are moving towards jail, not bail. Exactly. To, uh, let me tell you, when I started practice in the Supreme Court, I used to hardly do, do some bail cases. Maybe one a week, maybe once in 10 days. But today, from sheer statistics, I can say that jail is the rule because I do at least one bail a day, whether under GST, whether under PMLA, whether under custom. I mean, no longer, you know, a typical criminal cases of murder and rape and extortion. They seem to have kind of, kind of <laughs> disappeared in terms of numbers when you go to the higher courts. These are the only economic cases that we are doing. No, is that worrying? I know here is a former attorney general not too long ago saying we've now turned into a system where... Bail is the exception and jail is the rule. We are talking, as your book does, about cases that shaped India's financial landscape. I then wonder whether the courts have done enough to actually ensure ease of doing business in a country like India. We are actually reversing, perhaps, the very basis that post-1991 we thought a legal architecture would be created that would make it easier to do business in India. We seem to be making it more and more difficult if this is what is the nature of, uh, of the court's broader view uh, on, on, on critical matters. Well, that's true. I think uh, not just issues of criminality, right? We expect that judges know business. And we should expect that, right? After all, they're judging matters of the economy. They must be at least have basic familiarity with business common sense. But unfortunately, some of the judgments we have seen in the recent past show how divorced judges are from commercial reality. So one of the chapters I've discussed in this book relates to the 2G cases. So, uh, of course, that's a time when there's allegations of corruption. Uh, Mr. Raja is arrested. There's a whole trial that happens. The matter goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says that there has been an illegality in the allocation of licenses. How? They only say, no, these should have been auctioned. They were never auctioned. They were simply allotted as per the policy of that time. Right? <laughs> Having held that, they could have simply said, that's a wrong thing and in the future don't do it. They proceed to cancel 122 licenses. These licenses in the meanwhile have been purchased by foreign investors who were no, not party to this uh, allocation at all, had no idea as to how these licenses had, had been given. And with one stroke of pen of that judgment, put back the Indian telecom sector by decades, right? The problem is judges sometimes just judge by the touchstone of the constitution. They do not adequately analyze the economic impact of their decisions. Now, that is a, something that is a, a dire need. There must be an amicus brief in every case that happens that, yes, this is the judgment. But when you are giving relief, when you're deciding what to do, if you decided there's illegality, that's fine. You still have the liberty as a judge to say, all right, there's an illegality. Do I quash all the licenses? Do I impose a penalty? Do I ask the government to change the policy of the future? These are many options that the, that the court has. Why take the most lethal, the most difficult decision and cancel all the licenses? This happens because judges do not have the business common sense that is required sometimes. Is it the lack of business common sense or do you believe that judges at times almost reflexively are anti-business, anti-big business in particular? I think that depends on the judge concerned. There are judges and judges. There are ideologies that judges have. They will be, for instance, in, and the book discusses, and we all know that just some, someone like Justice Krishnayar, extremely left-wing judge, 
and they, I don't think could have been any industry but did anything right in his court. Right? So that was his worldview. And I think that is to be expected. Uh, judges will always decide with their own mindset, given their own background, their own ideology. But we must have an institutional mechanism which minimizes this bias. Right? I can't even call it a bias. I would say that their opinion is such. So there must be some way. You know, because one of the interesting cases you cite, and I come from Goa, so it's a case which has divided public opinion in Goa as well. The Goa Foundation versus Union of India, which effectively stopped what many would call illegal mining in Goa. But many Goans today say deprived us of our occupation and livelihood because almost for a decade now, those who were in the mining sector have not been able to do mining. Now, how does the judiciary strike the balance between environmentalists who say illegal mining or mining in general in Goa is unacceptable of the kind that's going on versus those who will say we need our jobs, we need our livelihood. The judges struggle at times, and this was a good example again where they simply said all, uh, 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 all mining to be stopped in Goa. Is it possible for judges to achieve a balance? Should they be balanced? Uh, Balance is a must. Just hold it closer, sir. Balance is a must. As I said, you can't use a hammer to kill a fly. So you have to strike a balance. You gave the example of Goa. Goa, Karnataka, and Odisha. Yes. Three mining uh, mineral rich states. The Supreme Court banned all mining. You ban illegal mining, direct the government to take steps to catch illegal miners. Fine. Mm -hmm. But you cannot, uh, you know, then the remedy is worse than the disease. You ban all mining in all states. Look at the, 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 the cost. Millions of jobs are gone. Millions of transporters are gone. Millions of truck drivers are, are gone without jobs. You can't do that. That's not, I mean, uh, that's not what the law is supposed to be. That by a stroke of pen, all the coal mining allocations all the, uh, the mining leases were cancelled because they should not have been allotted. They should have been given by auction. You can't, uh, you know, create an upheaval. So every time you give a judgment, mm -hmm. especially when you are dealing with one full sector, you must see what will be the impact. And there is no law, there is no norm which says that when you set aside a decision, you must go the whole hog from the beginning to the end as if the decision was never taken. You don't need to do that. You have to temper it. You have to reason it. You have to tweak it. You can sometimes make it prospective. The Supreme Court has power to say that his judgment will be prospective. We'll apply from today. So he said, look here. Whatever has happened in the allocations in the past, we are not touching, but we are warning you this was wrong. But from tomorrow, start the process of auction, no allocation. Fair enough. So somewhere, or find them, or do something. But the impact on millions of jobs must be seen. And this has put the country back. Your GDP is reduced by a single decision given by a bench of the Supreme Court who is not able to see beyond, you see what the what the rule of legality or illegality is and then you you, you know you're, you're saying rules. that but i know my friends in goa who are environmentalists have a completely different op uh, uh, opinion they say it's the best thing that happened because they they believe that business uh, that mining in goa will otherwise always remain uh, an area which will be environmentally unfriendly so you know that's the challenge that you're catering to different interest groups different pressure groups each of whom have their own point of view and and often these cases get prolonged over an extended period of time. You need a fixed time frame, presumably, in which these cases are sorted out. We are now a decade since the, the, the mining case of, uh, uh, in the Goa Foundation case. So I just wonder whether we will ever get speedier and surer justice. You know, you mentioned it depends on which bench almost that you go before. You know, give me the judge and I'll give you a judgment in this country is what some people are worried. It all depends on which you're smiling when I say that. Because obviously you also know that often the bench seems to decide the nature of the judgment. Let me give you an example on the lighter side. Last week, yes. I appeared in a case, a small case, where against one judgment, three different appeals were filed by three different people. 
it went to three different benches. It should have gone to one bench. It went to three different benches, and the three different benches on the same facts had three different views. Three different views? Yes. One dismissed the petition, one admitted the petition and granted a stay, and the third took a middle position. Now you tell me, there is nothing which is black and white in courts or in the law. It's all gray. It depends on several factors. And I'm giving you a concrete example. I was astonished because I appeared in one of the three. And I was told these are the other two. And I put all three before the court. Maybe, I, you, sh maybe you should be briefed on all three. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I want to raise one final issue, which is judiciary versus executive. You know, we've got a very powerful executive today. We started off by mentioning it in the context of appointments of judges. But even many of the cases that you cite, including the Aadhaar judgment, for example, which emphasized the right to privacy on one side, but also said that Aadhaar was constitutional. Even though the government of India took Aadhaar as a money bill to the Rajya Sabha because they didn't have a majority and wanted it passed in the Rajya Sabha. Do you believe that the courts are intimidated by the government or the courts are itching for a confrontation with the government or the courts are desperate to take a middle path at the moment? Are our judges intimidated? Are they ready to take on uh, the, the, uh, the executive? Well, I think that again depends on the judges concerned, right? It depends much on the bench. There are judges who are ideologically pro-government. There are, and I think that is increasingly a problem that we have with our jud higher judiciary. It's not the polit particular political party, but there are a lot of judges who believe the government is an agent of good and can do no wrong. So whatever decision comes to them, by whichever government, from state, maybe it be the Congress in the state or uh, BJP in the center, it doesn't matter to them. They think the government is right and we will rule in favor of the government. And that is an increasing problem we see in many, many matters uh, in, in, in court. This bias, this automatic assumption that the government is the agent of good and we have public interest in our heart and public interest in, is equals the view of the government. That's a mindset that many judges have. Are you saying, Saurabh, therefore, that like we, I believe our newsrooms are polarized, the judiciary is just as polarized, judges, including right at the very top in the Supreme Court, are very, very polarized, very sharply divided on ideological grounds? See, this is not an ideology of the left versus the right I'm talking of. It's pro-government or anti-government? Pro any government, anti, anti the people, effectively, right? So in a, in a fight between the government on the one hand and an individual on the other, you start with a disadvantage if you are represented as a private in entity. In one line, Rajdi, it is pro-government as government. Not Congress government or BJP government Correct. or AAP government. I have an uphill task as against the government on the other side. That, that's, that's the long and short of it. Okay. It's uh, not which government, hmm. the government. Correct. Okay, Nabila is on stage, which is a, uh, obviously a message that it's time. <laughs> it, it's time for to adjourn, to adjourn the case. But I will ask one final question, also, if I may. Sir, you may throw two questions to the audience. Okay, I will. Uh, okay, then, let, you know, I, was, I will put my final question at the end. Uh, Nalini is with Law Today, which is our wonderful new website that we've started. Uh, Nalini, you have a question. Uh, the mic is with you. Uh, so the yeah, go ahead. This question is for the both of you. Uh, for Kirpal, sir, uh, considering, I mean, you know how important seniority while appointment of judges can be. If your name had been recommended at the time when it was recommended, it had, if you had been appointed then, then you could have gone on to becoming either a Chief Justice of a High Court or even possibly being elevated to the Supreme Court. So do you think that this is an opportunity that you have missed out because the Collegium as well as the Center did not hear your name on time? And in addition to that, has it ever brought in thoughts of withdrawing your consent regarding the judgeship? Well, the short answer to the second question is no. The very reason I accepted the offer of elevation and, and I gave my consent was not because I thought it was a matter of personal ambition. And I don't think it should ever be a case that a judge accepts uh, an offer of elevation because they think it's a good career move on their part. That is rather dangerous because given the low salaries that judges get, anyone who thinks it's an improvement in their lifestyle is not doing it for the correct reason. It was always a calling. It is always about public service, right? For me, there was an added uh, reason 
that I was also from a community that was not yet represented on the bench, i.e. the queer community. So for all these reasons is why I accepted an offer to, uh, to be elevated. And that reason has not changed. So if it is no longer about me and my professional ambitions, then whether I become a Chief Justice or not, whether I go to the Supreme Court or not, that is not relevant, right? So I don't really mind if uh, five years hence or whenever, if ever, this happens, I lose out on my seniority because that was never my consideration. So, and that is why I come to the second part, I will not withdraw my consent. One last question. Is there somebody else who has a question? Yes, the gentleman here. Yes. The mic, yeah. Go ahead. Can't hear you. Good evening, everyone. My question is to Mukul, What's your sir. name? My name is Naman, and I'm from Sirsa, Haryana. Sir, my question is to you. Few days back, a DM was killed by sand mafias, and Siddhu Musiwala was shot dead uh, five, six months back. How a normal citizen will feel that we are safe in this country when so powerful people can be killed mercilessly and uh, they, and uh, father of Siddhu Musayala said, on this 29th, uh, it will uh, complete around five or six months, and I will left this country because I have no faith, uh, no, I don't think that this country will give me uh, my... Okay, I, 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 you know, you know, he's effectively asking you a question which has a political angle as well. I mean, if a Siddhu Musewala is killed, if the sand mining by mafia, that seems to be no fear of the law. You've been an attorney general. Do you get a sense that there is no fear of the law? A question that we raised briefly also during the discussion. See, I, I won't say that there is absolutely no fear of the law. Right-minded people, civilized people have the fear of law. If there is no fear of law, then be complete lawlessness and will be law of the jungle. But yes, <laughs> there are several elements who are criminal elements who don't have fear of the law essentially for one reason. And that reason is that justice is not prompt or swift in our country. If there is a, a criminal, he by and large believes that in a few months or a year, he might get bail, and once he gets bail, the trial will take 10 or 20 years. So in that sense, the fear of conviction becomes hazy and distant, and this w w would be completely arrested if the trial is to be completed within a year or two. But then those are separate issues which require to be separately debated. Sure. I, you know, I, I want to say, while we've sort of looked at the darker side of the law, also let's remember we are a step ahead of the United States when it comes to abortion. The United States has turned its back on Roe versus Wade. Our judiciary, on the other hand, has empowered Indian women uh, and legalized abortion. So I think we are in many ways a step ahead, but I'll give the gent here one, one question. Yes, sir. Quickly, sir, please. Very quickly. A question, Mike. My, my name is Kesi Garg. I, am, I came from Gurgaon. I have a question to Mr. Mukul Rothgi, sir. Uh, that when we are spending so much in the infrastructure development, why not in the legal system? Why can't we have a timeline for each category of the case that it will enter on this date? This is the expiry of this case for the judgment. Let's say, let's say, three months to three years. Why can't we? Why we are crying for uh, the you know courtroom judges and so many things? Why we can't create a layer of the judgment? Okay. Why do we don't have such system? A time limit for judges, no, for are, judgments. You are right, uh, Mr. Garg. There is no doubt that justice must be delivered promptly. It should have an expiry date, as you say. There is a statute of limitations in the U.S. that a judgment must be delivered within such and such time, failing which the arrested people will go scot-free. We don't have that. That should be there, but then that's an ideal situation. I mean, why do you talk only of the law? Should we not have an environment which doesn't have pollution? Should we not have roads which have no congestion? Should we not have a system where things are working smoothly? You know, this country is going through a lot of churning, a lot of problems. The, the answer to your uh, question, obviously the answer is yes, it should be. But how it can be involves a lot of things. It involves the government in appointing judges. Right. It involves changing the legal systems in making justice fast. All those things are required. We are grappling with this for the last 50 years. 
देर नो मैजिक वॉर्ड के तीन साल में जजमेंट हो जाना चाहिए उसके लिए जज भी चाहिए टाइम भी चाहिए मेनी मेनी ओके सो एज वी एंड नो सर नो एज वी एंड वी स्टार्टेड ऑफ विद द होल नोशन ऑफ वाई इज इन सॉर ऑफ अ जज येट एंड वी होप दैट सम वन आउट देर इज लिस्निंग एंड विल करेक्ट वॉट अपियर्स प्राइम ऑफ एसी कंप्लीटली आर्बिट्री एंड अनफेयर बट आई वॉन्ट टू आस्क बोथ ऑफ यू एट दी एंड अ क्वेश्चन दैट ऑफन ट्रेवल्स मी ड्यू बिलीव वेरी शॉर्ट आंसर that there should be a cooling off period for our judges that at least 3 years after retirement they do not accept any government or any government benefits or post retirement benefits or any judicial commissions for 3 years at least certainly not rajya sabha as one of our former chief justices just did all of that should end i entirely agree with this proposal i have openly said that it should be whether it's 2 years whether it's 3 years is a matter of debate but yes and if you remember late mr jetly in parliament used to say that we cannot have retirement post for judges ready that the moment you retire you become uh, a chairman of electricity tribunal or a telecom tribunal or a mines tribunal it should be there because it has been seen or or the perception is there clearly that very often toward the end of a career of a judge which may take 20 years to end towards the end the judge starts thinking what's going to be the future because he's been out of competition as a lawyer and then you know sometimes the judgments can be little more pro government if i may use that phrase and therefore to 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 break this syndrome you must have a vacuum okay that's a that it, and sort of you have a view the short answer is yes right there should be a cooling off there period. should be a cooling off if at all anything you see even if the judge is not biased and not given a decision because of the promise of a appointment even if that is not the genuine reason to the lay person that's what it seems like and you run a system of justice not only about what it is but what it appears to the common man and to the common man it seems that here is a judgment that has come in favor of the government one week after the retirement that judge is appointed to a tribunal there is obviously some quid pro quo and therefore on that reason alone as i say caesar's wife must be above suspicion there should be a cooling off period on that positive note uh, wonderful applause, to have both of you uh, looking uh, at uh, giving us a sort of birds eye view as well as the broader picture of the state of our judiciary and using this book a wonderful book to reflect on that because this really goes from bank nationalization all the way up to the insolvency and bankruptcy code so thank you all very much saurabh kirpal mukul rodgi pleasure having you here at the sahitya english sammelan thank you thank and you do so pick much, up sir. the book it's available there at full yeah, circle the the full circle counter right at the far end right you have um, saurabh's books there you can get interact with him maybe get a sign from him thank you very much really appreciate your presence on stage sir thank you bye so bye much. bye thank you sir all right up next we have uh, a session All right 